Uh, you know, when we were worshiping this morning, I just, the presence of God was just so awesome. It was so amazing, you know, His presence. I believe that God is going to do something this morning, and you will not leave unchanged. Amen. You cannot come into God's presence and stay the same. He always changes us, even if it's just a little bit. He always changes us. You see that when the, uh, the Magi, you know, the one we like to call the three kings, those three kings never existed in the Bible, okay? Uh, they're called Magi, and they're not three, right? Just said Magi, that's a lot. And anyway, the thing is they were looking for Jesus, and they finally eventually found him. But when they were going to leave his presence, the Lord spoke to them and said, do not go back the same way. And so the Bible says they left another way. You cannot go back the same way after having met Jesus. He always changes your path. Amen? And it's always better. Amen. Praise God. All right. I need to get into the Word because I am on one of the most difficult missions uh, today, which is to try and end early. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to shorten my message, but uh, we will try. So let me give you the title, and then let's turn to the Lord in prayer. I entitled this, Save to Serve. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, because you inhabit the praises of your people. And we know that praise looks good on us. So as we praise you, we become more and more beautiful because we encounter you. And for this morning, Lord, we ask that you anoint every one of us, that we might hear your word and cause us to understand that it might transform us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Save to serve. <clears throat> I was thinking of doing a series on this, but We'll see what happens. There's something else that the Lord put in my mind. And uh, we'll just pray. We have our anniversary coming up, two Sundays from now. I'm really excited about that. That's at four o'clock, 5 o'clock. So make sure you come at 5. We'll only have one service. And you want to come earlier than 5. Because we've got stuff prepared and you don't want to miss that. Okay? So uh, come early. Come here at 4 o'clock. You know, come here at 4.30 enjoy the gathering grounds and the rest of the celebration which you can enjoy even before we start at five so come early okay all right save to serve when a person comes to christ and he or she is born again in the spirit the first thing that happens to that person is he becomes part of a family as I mentioned before, uh, like Father's Day, the favorite, most favorite title of God is Father. So much so in the Trinity, that's what he's known. Father, together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. Of all the titles he could have chosen, that's what he chose. Father, Abba, or Av. And he knew because also, even way before Adam sinned, he was always known father, as father, because he knew what Adam would do. Even in eternity past, he knew that when he would create man, man would sin, and that relationship between father and son, and Eve, daughter, would get severed. And he knew that the greatest need of mankind would be a father. We would be lost without fathers. And that's why men, NDKs, modern day knights, we have a responsibility to father not just our kids, but the next generation, whoever they might be. They can be other people's kids, but we're here for others. Just like you heard Jeremiah, we're here to serve. We're here to raise up the next generation. So we become part of a family. And now whatever kind of father we had or have 
if he's still alive. No matter how wonderful he might be, or wicked he might be, no father outside of God, other than God, is perfect. Even the best of fathers will somehow disappoint us one way or another. And so this family that we become a part of has only three perfect persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the rest of us, we're all imperfect. All growing. God does not look for per perfection, but He does look for progression. That we become more and more like Him. So the all the rest of us, no matter how long you've been in Christ, we are all a work in progress. Some of us need more work than others, but no matter how long you've been in the Lord, we all need a lot of work, right? doesn't matter. I, I, I was sharing with you last week, this month, on the 24th, I will be celebrating 40 years of walking with Jesus. 40 years. And, yes, thank you. But... The point is, even with 40 years, I feel like there's still more work that needs to be done than work that was done in me. That's how broken every one of us uh, is. Some more than others, but everyone broken. We are all a work in progress. And that's why we are not in a position to judge anyone. We can judge their words. We can judge their works. But we never judge people. Because everyone is facing a battle that you may not know of. And everyone is still a work in progress. And where God may have delivered you, he's probably still working on someone else. So what are we called to do? Just love one another, accept one another, and say, welcome to the family. Amen? That's the best thing you can do. Just say, welcome to the family because it's the blessed family to be in. Amen? And now, that means, all of a sudden, everything, including all those years behind you, all the years before Christ came into your life, all the hurt, all the pain, all the sorrows, all the joys, all the victories, all the triumphs, all the failures, all of them will serve a purpose. Our God is a redeemer. He redeems even our brokenness. He redeems. That's why even when we walk, as Jeremiah was saying, in the valley of the shadow of death, and you have your own struggles, but there's a purpose for that because there will be others you will meet later on with similar struggles, but you will now be in a position to say, I've been there, I understand. And it doesn't make you better than them, it just allows you to guide them with greater compassion and without judgment. Ano yan lang? Nahirapan ka na? Yan lang? Right? Some people are like that. Because for them it might be easy. But what might be easy for you is difficult for others, and vice versa. So the thing here is that God is changing you from the inside out. The first thing God is working on is your character. So he makes you grow in Christ-likeness, to become more like Christ. But the second manifestation that you are in the kingdom is that you are serving the one you claim to worship. See, here's the thing. You will always serve whatever or whomever you worship. God built us that way. So if you are worshiping anything or anyone other than God, you will become like that. The problem is, nothing in this whole universe is perfect except God. And so when you worship something that was created, then you are worshiping something that is essentially broken. And so you don't get better. You might think you're getting better in one area of your life, but it's destroying you in another area. Only God is the one we can serve where he makes you whole inside and out. So serving, which is the second manifestation of being in this family, becomes an inevitable fruit of God's work. Because all of us 
were designed. Every single one of us was designed to serve, to work. We just have to choose our master. But every one of us is serving someone or something. So a person cannot say that you are a true follower of Jesus if you are not serving him. Because if you're not serving him, you're serving someone or something else. You, there is no person in this world that is not serving something or someone. Every one of us. That's how God designed us. That's why God wants us to serve him. Because that becomes the fruit of worshiping him. You will always serve the one you worship. Always. And the thing is, it doesn't even matter whether you believe that statement or not. It doesn't matter. It is truth. You will serve whatever you worship. How do we know then if we are serving Jesus, if we're serving God? Well, one major manifestation of that is you will be serving others. That's why Jesus gave us the one another ministry. Love one another, forgive one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, and so on and so forth. All of these one another's. You cannot one another someone by yourself. That's why you cannot grow as a believer isolated from the church, isolated from everyone else, because you cannot one another yourself. You need to one another someone else. And that's why God always wanted us to be in a community. It's just that he called that community family. We are all family. And we are called to serve one another. It's a true sign of maturity that you are growing and that you are serving properly. I want to talk about serving because like I said, we are saved to serve. And I want to share with you this morning, as usual, three points. But the three tenses, past, present, and future, of serving. Okay? So here's my first point. Serving was demonstrated. This is the past tense. Serving was demonstrated. The Great Commission includes, in its statement, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Right? You remember the Great Commission? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Teaching them, verse 20, teaching them to obey. Obedience is taught. Obedience does not come naturally. And the, and the teaching of obedience is a process called discipleship. You will never, listen, you will never. I'm not saying it's difficult. I'm saying it is impossible. You will never be able to serve God well when you refuse to be Discipled. Why? Because you're in disobedience. Jesus said, go and make disciples. That's not a divine request. It's not a divine suggestion. It's a command. You need to be discipled so that you can obey the command to make disciples. You cannot give what you don't have. If you're not being discipled, you will not be able to disciple others, nor will there be a desire to disciple others, and therefore you remain in disobedience. Obedience is taught, which means obedience is intentional. It doesn't happen automatically, and it is, especially in the beginning, inconvenient. Going to care group means you need to carve out time. I'm telling already our care group leaders that we need to get out of the Zoom room and start meeting face to face. Okay? Discipleship is not about convenience. Discipleship is about obedience. It's about obedience. So it's going to be inconvenient in the beginning. That's why it has to be intentional until obedience becomes the desire of your heart. The good news is, when you get saved, he works on that desire. He said, and I will make them obey me. So that's God's work. And that's the good news. Okay. Biblical obedience, therefore, is seen in the way we serve one another. 
That's the one another ministry I was talking about. It's the culture of the kingdom. In fact, the Apostle Paul put it this way. In Galatians 5.13, he said, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. So that's freedom, and that's good. But, and here's the caveat of freedom. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Another version says, Do not use your freedom to indulge your lustful desires. Rather, here's the reason, serve one another humbly in love. You were set free to serve. Not to do what you want, to serve. To do what God wants. He set you free for Him. Not just for yourself. So, this is the reason for your freedom. And here's the thing, it takes maturity and strength of character to be able to serve with humility. Because some people can serve with a bad attitude. Right? Ito na nga, serve ako ng serve. Tapos wala man ni isang thank you card. They didn't remember my birthday. Grabe. Right? I know that's not you. I'm talking about the one beside you. Okay? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. And here, it says, for the, here, look at this. For the entire law, the Hebrew word, this is written in Greek, but the Hebrew word here is Torah. The entire law is fulfilled in this one command. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law, the first five books of the Bible, the entire Torah rests the fulfillment of this rests in this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Therefore, serving one another is the highest fulfillment of the law. To this end, Jesus demonstrated the highest expression of love. Imagine, he always was and always will be the king of kings creator of the universe. And what did this king of kings, creator of the universe do? He served his creation. Look at this in John 13. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, he took off his garments and washed his disciples' feet. You see that in John 13, in the upper room. And after he had done that and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? See, he was probably looking at their faces and saying, why is he doing this to us? Even Peter said, don't wash my feet. And that's why Jesus said, if you don't let me wash you, then you're out. Okay, okay. Give me a bath, <laughs> he said. That's what I like about Peter. You know, he talks before he thinks. You know, so, I love the guy. Kind of sounds like me. You know. Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's who I am, he said. Now, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. Now, I want you to understand, what's the big deal about washing feet? Well, first of all, washing feet was done by slaves. Okay, that was done by slaves. And usually slaves that are still slaves in training. That means they're not even good slaves yet. All they can do is wash feet. Don't, don't wash the dishes. Don't clean the house. You're going to break something. Just wash feet and try and get it right. Okay? The, this was the most menial of tasks. And normally given to the least among the slaves. And he said, if I, your Lord, your King, your Master, and your Teacher, if I've washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. That means, don't think of yourself so highly that you're not willing to go down and do work that is beneath you. He said, don't think that way. That's not right. Do whatever is needed. Help wherever 
it's needed. Doesn't matter what the help is. He says, oh, no, no, me, Buhat Brigade, help bring up all the stuff from gathering grounds of the office. No, I don't do that. I eat, but I don't bring those stuff. See? No, that's, not, that's not me. Don't you know? I'm a bank manager. I'm a CEO. I'm a business owner. I'm floor manager in the office, a.k.a. janitor, right? <laughs> I don't help doing things like that. No way. So, no, that's for the young Christians. I've been a member of this church for 10 years. I don't do that. I'm just waiting for a pastor to call me up so I can preach. I want to hold the mic. You can't hold the mic if you can't hold the push cart. Yeah. You know, when I was in training, I had, even though, you know, uh, the ministry started way, way back in the 80s at Broadway Centrum. Some of you were here. I know Ike was with us, right? And a few others, the Samsons also were with us at that time. And a few of you that were there. And I just graduated from college. I came back to the Philippines. And the Lord said, go into the ministry. And so I did. And since my stepdad was the senior pastor of the church, I said, I will be associate pastor of the church. And the first thing I did was scrape bubble gum off the floors of Broadway Centrum. And he said, you're going to start from down there. You know, and the thing is, it was not just being the son of the pastor of the church. Because the pastor of the church also happened to own Broadway Centrum, Right? And so, I was also the son of the owner of Broadway Centrum. And so, every time I would be scraping the bubble gum and the guards would pass, they always say, Sir. <laughs> I said, when you see me on the ground scraping, don't sir me. Right? When I'm dressed, I'm standing up, I'm walking, you can sir me. But not when I'm on the floor. Not when I'm on the ceiling. Not when I'm on the CR scrubbing the floors and the toilet bowls. Right? And so it was hard. It says, so I said, so stop setting me. Yes, sir. I said that. <laughs> he said, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have, and here, listen to Jesus. For I have given you an example. He's not just commanding. He said, let me do it and show you how it's done. He didn't just command from his throne. Say, okay, all you minions, serve one another. No, he came down. He put on our garments of flesh, dressed like us, spoke like us, and said, this is how you do it. Now follow me. That you, should also, that you, sh you also should do just as I have done to you. This scene alone should be sufficient to emphasize how much Jesus values serving. He left us an example to follow. He said, you should do as I have done. Do it to one another. And that's why each of you is called to serve the people sitting next to you. In different ways. Maybe they need a prayer. Maybe they need a word of encouragement. Maybe they just need your ear. Whatever it is with one another. And the phrasing is such that it is not optional. When he said, you should, he's not just saying it's a good idea, but you know, I can understand if you're too busy. No, 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 that's not what he meant. He's just very gracious. He, he didn't say you must, but that's what he meant. This is not a suggestion. Jesus himself said that he came to serve, not to be served. Imagine the king of kings coming down and saying, Ask me whatever you want. I'll do it for you. He's the king. What king says that to his subjects? Ask me whatever. I'll do it for you. That's the past tense. Here's the present. Second, serving is intentional. For many, this is the constant struggle. Sometimes we just want to quit serving. Because it gets tiring. Serving gets tiring. And many times, let's be honest, many times serving others is 
thankless. Ask any mom. It's a thankless job. The sacrifices they make. Ask the dads. Ask anyone. Anyone in ministry. It's a thankless job. Serving. Especially if you are behind. See, me, I'm in front. You see me up here holding a mic every Sunday. I go out. Some of you are so gracious. Pastor, I was so blessed by the message. You know, and I just don't ask. But if I say, what blessed you? Ah, but it was nice. <laughs> You know? Right? What did you learn? I was so blessed. See, but at least I hear that from time to time. But what about those who are behind the scene? Like behind this curtain. All the people that work behind this curtain. All those who work up there. You don't get to see them because all of you are facing here. They see the back of your head. You don't even see their backside, front side, or side side. Right? You don't see them. But without them... This is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I'll have to have my computer here, all these cables coming out, connected all the way there. Don't step on the cables, right? Because I'll, you'll trip this and all that. There are dozens of people working together just to make this one service work. And now we have a third service, right? A third service. And that stretches all of our partners. You know what? We need partners. That's why I'm preaching this. We need partners. Okay? Amen. Here's the thing about serving, right? Serving is intentional, but many times we want our me time. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There is a time for me time. But God is more concerned about the we time. Because the me time doesn't get any rewards. There are no rewards for taking a nap. There are no rewards for watching Netflix. It says, oh my gosh, my son, Netflix, number one, here's your crown. Right? No, you don't get any rewards for watching Netflix. But you will get rewards when you serve others. That's what he rewards. Philippians chapter 2, don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast. Ouch. It's so easy to boast when you're up here because you're seen. And so you have to constantly watch your heart, check your heart. Am I doing this for the right reason? And you know what the best of us, most of the time, our motives are at best mixed. We want to do the right thing, but sometimes the flesh comes in and says, Grabe, ang galing mo. And then when people say, Grabe, I was so blessed. And there's a part of you that just says, Yes, I know. But all glory to God. <laughs> right? Sure. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble. Be humble. Turn to your neighbor and, and just say, Be humble. Now turn back to that person and say, I know. <laughs> but be humble toward one another. Don't just be humble, but toward the person next to you. Be humble toward him or her. Always considering others. Always, I check the Greek. Always means always. Okay? Always considering others. Better than yourself. It's like, what? I'm better than this person. I know I'm better than this person. I can preach better than them. I can sing. Not, not me. Arnold can sing better than them. Right? And there are things you just, you know, you can do better than one sitting next to you. Right? You know that. And look out for one another's interests. Not just for your own. See, there's always a temptation to do things out of selfish ambition. I want to be this or that. I want to have this. I want to be recognized. And the only way to, the biblical way to counter this is to consider others better than yourselves. Now, this is not about lying. Maybe you can sing better than the one sitting next to you. And you don't have to lie and say, you know, you sing better than me. 
Right? You know you're lying. Every time they sing, Yolanda comes. Right? That's not what it means. What it means is that you need to understand their worth in Christ. Because Jesus died for that person. Yes, maybe you sing better than them. You cook better than them. You talk better than them. But Jesus also died for them. That's their worth in God's eyes. They just have different talents. That's really what it means to consider them better than yourself. And why do they have that worth? Because number one, they are loved by God and because we're called to serve. And we serve them. Look at Philippians chapter 2. The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus Christ had. So he's talking about attitude, not talents. Because some will sing better than others. Some can cook better than others. Some can write, talk, paint, etc. better than others. But that's not the point. The point is our attitude. He said, you should have this attitude, the one that Jesus Christ had. He always had the nature of God. Listen, he never stopped, even when he put on flesh, he never stopped being God. He did not leave his godness in heaven and was only human on earth. He never stopped being God the Son of God, even when He was clothed in flesh, He could have called for lightning and made it happen in His own power. He could have stopped storms in His own power. He had it resident in Him. He never stopped being God. And that's so important to understand. He always had that nature, but... He did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. In other words, he knew it, but he didn't brag about it. Those words never came out of his lips when he said, Di mo ba ako kilala? Don't you know? If anyone can say that, it should be him. None of us have a right to say that. But he does, but he never did. And he said, follow me. Instead of this, of his own free will, that means he was not forced to do it, but he did it anyway. Of his own free will, he gave up all he had. See, here's the thing. If you think you have anything that you believe should exalt you, Right? I live in a certain village. I have a certain lifestyle. I drive a certain car. I have this amount of money. I've got this and that. And I, 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 I wear not just one Rolex. I've got three more on this side. You know? And all that. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having nice things. I'm not against nice things. It's the attitude about these things that we exalt ourselves because we have more things we're better than others. No, we are not better than anyone. You just probably have a nicer car. doesn't make you better. Your car might be better. But he gave up all he had. Question, how much are you willing to give up? I'm not saying give it away. I'm just saying don't worship it too much. Don't worship it too much. How do I know if I'm worshiping it or not? This is what I say. If you can't give it away, when the, if and when the Lord tells you to give it away, you're worshiping it. That's why don't buy idols. If you buy a nice car, and the Lord tells you to give it away one day, and you can't, you bought an idol. So buy away cars that you can give away, just in case He tells you to give it away. You know? You know why? Because a Toyota will also get you to the same place as a Mercedes-Benz, right? But a Mercedes-Benz is more worshipable. <laughs> Nobody worships their Vios. Oh my gosh, I got a Vios! Take note, Vios, <laughs> right? 2015, latest. <laughs> huh? 
hybrid. No, he gave up all he had. It's not that he gave everything away, but he was willing to. And that's the only thing. Just be willing to. Otherwise, you're holding on to an idol. And then what else did he do? He took the nature of a servant. Do you see how intentional he is? He took it. He wasn't born that way. In the words of, who sang that? Lady Gaga, was it? Right? If she came here, I don't know if she did. She probably changed her name. You don't want to be going around, everyone calling you Gaga. <laughs> but she's not here, so she can keep her name. That's okay. But he took the nature of a servant by choice. He said, this is who I am, but I want to serve because my kingdom, I'm going ahead of myself. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. See, until you're willing to serve humbly, it will affect your obedience. This is the reason why he was able to be obedient to the very end. Some people are obedient until the point of inconvenience. Until the point of pain. And then, well, no more. I'm just, I'll obey until here, but whew, that's too much. That's too much for me. It's one thing to be humble in a given situation, but to remain humble, not holding on to your rights, but rather insisting on your right to serve others before yourself. This is how Jesus remained obedient. He insisted to serve. He said, Peter, let me wash your feet. No, you're not going to wash my feet. I want to wash your feet. Let me wash your feet. No, you won't. He understood. This is my master. Why is he the one going to wash my feet? Then you will have nothing in me. Okay, then give me a bath. See? He insisted, let me wash your feet. And that's why he was consistent. There are three reasons why there's such a lack of integrity in ministry, in serving. First, we put ourselves first. We put ourselves first, not the people we're called to serve. Me first. Second, we don't think like kingdom citizens. Sons who serve. Yes, we're son of God. We're sons and daughters of God. But we are called to serve. We think serving is beneath us. It demeans us. It diminishes us. This kingdom exalts the ones who serve. Amen? And the third reason is because we don't see people the way Jesus sees them. Which brings me to my final point. Serving, future, will be rewarded. There's a story in the Bible in Matthew 25 where Jesus will separate the sheep from the goats. You remember that? Some of you probably read that. He will separate the sheep from the goats. Let's look at the sheep first. Beginning with verse 33. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me, and you said, Welcome home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick. You cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones, he calls them righteous. These righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and gave you clothing? When did we ever take you to SM? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, that's the household of faith, the church, you were doing it to me. He takes serving personally. When you don't do it, when you do it to others, you're doing it to me. Now let's look at the goats. Verse 41, then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you. 
You cursed once. You know, I would not want to hear those words. Can you imagine Jesus saying, away with you. Depart from me. You cursed ones. Oh my gosh. Into the eternal fire. Prepared not for them. For the devil. But since you want to go his way. You can join him. And his demons. And here's the reason why. I was hungry. You didn't feed me. I was thirsty. You didn't give me any drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. So what made one sheep and another goat? It was serving others. It was about serving. Always been about serving. Serving the household of faith. He said, my brothers and sisters when you did it to them you did it to me that's why the fulfillment of the law is the law is fulfilled in this one command love your neighbor as yourself anyone can say i'm born again anyone can say i'm a christian anyone can say i love god show me your service show me how you serve Show me how you take care of the household of faith. Serving others will be rewarded. This is the highest form of living in God's kingdom. Nothing beats this. Nothing. The Bible says, many will say, Lord, Lord. And he said, what's he going to tell them? He says, hey, get away from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity, he said. And perhaps that's why Jesus said, if anyone wants to truly follow me, he must first deny himself. You cannot serve God well or claim to follow God well. If you always put yourself first. What I want to do. What is convenient for me. No. He said you must deny yourself. First. That's the first thing. That's where we're going to start. Deny yourself. Oh and then there's a second one. Take up your cross daily. Luke said. Luke wrote. Take up your cross daily. Every day. There's something in you that needs to die. That's what the cross is for. When he said, take up your cross daily, that's not a reminder to put on your necklace with a cross there. That's not what it means. The cross is an execution stake. It is an instrument of death. And so when he says, take up your cross, they understood what that meant. Something in you needs to die so that you can serve me better. So that you can love me better. So you can worship me better. Now I'll give you the grace to do it. But if you're not moving in that direction, you need to take inventory of yourself. Are you really following me? Because here's the proof. Are you serving me? Only those who deny themselves will be able to serve God consistently and righteously. So what's my bottom line? First, this is a miracle. It's only 11.40. And I'm already in my bottom line. This is good. This is good. First, Jesus exemplified serving. He didn't just talk about it. It was his lifestyle. He lived for others. Think about it. Jesus one day was walking and he was going somewhere and he had, his, he had his crew with him. These 12 guys that he went around with all the time. Possibly even some women, the Bible says, were with him. And he was walking. They were going wherever. The Bible doesn't say. And this one man taps on his shoulder and says, My daughter's dying. Jairus by name. My daughter's dying. Can you come over to my house and please lay your hands on my daughter? And he says, Sure. I'll go there. By the way, where do you live? Oh, across town. He says, let's go. And along the way, another one taps him by the edge of his garment. 
just so she might be healed from her issue of blood of 12 years. And that could have been her death. Because if you are a woman that's bleeding, you don't touch anyone, especially a holy man. You will be stoned to death. And it was a risk she took to touch the edge of his garment. And the Bible says, she said, I'll just sneak up. He won't even feel me. I'll just really, just from behind. I just need to touch him because I know there's power flowing out of him. Just one touch and I'll disappear into the background. And as soon as she did, he stops, turns around. Who touched me? And she said, Patay. I thought I was quiet. And then he said another time, who touched me? And nobody wanted to admit. He was taking his time looking for someone, not because he was angry, but because he wanted to encourage her. And finally, sheepishly, she admitted, I did. And she said, woman, your faith has made you well. Go. And turns and says, okay, Jai, let's go. And so they start walking. Somebody from his household comes out. Don't disturb the master. Your daughter is dead. And he said, Jairu said, Pastilan. You are taking too much time with that woman. Now my daughter's dead. What the heck? And what did Jesus say? Yo, chill. Right? Well, the Bible says, do not fear, only believe. Right? Today, it's one word. Chill. Oh. She's not dead. She's asleep. And right there, I believe, when he released those words, she came back to life. But her eyes were still closed. It's hard to sleep with your eyes open, right? So she's asleep. When you go there, he saw, yes, she's dead. And he said, watch this, little girl, get up. And boom, she gets up. He served. He doesn't mind being inconvenienced. He was going this way, Jairus comes, okay, let's go there. A woman comes, okay, let's talk for a while. He was willing to be inconvenienced. Are we? Ah, you know, this is my day off. It's already 10 o'clock. I don't talk to anyone after 10. Are we willing to be inconvenienced? Second, and this is important to understand, you are a son or daughter of God who serves. Understand, the first part, that's your identity. Son or daughter of God. But the second part, that's your calling. You're a servant. We are sons and daughters who serve. You cannot separate these two statements if you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, washed his disciples' feet, the work of a slave. But you see, here's the thing. He was so secure in his identity. I know who I am. I am the Son of God. I am God. So if I serve and look like a slave, that doesn't make me a slave. It just makes me a son who serves. A slave who serves, there is no glory in that. But a king who serves, that is glorious. Sons who serve, that is glorious. If you are in Christ, then you are the son or daughter of a king. The question is, do you know that? And if your answer is yes, that's good. But are you convinced of who you are? That no matter what you do, no matter how humble or humiliating your serving is, it doesn't change your worth. Because your worth is not in your serving. Your worth is in who you are. No service can change your identity in Christ. But you need to be convinced of who you are. And the question is, are you able to serve with joy? Even, 
in the most menial of tasks. Are you willing to, for example, serve in kids' church? We've got a third service and we don't have kids' church yet because we just don't have enough teachers yet. Do this to your neighbor and say, parang ikaw atang ano, <laughs> sinasabihan ni pastor. Huh? Parang ikaw yan. Are you willing to serve in production? Are you willing to serve in campus ministry? You know, they just ministered again to, how many students was that? 1,200 students. Yeah, Chester was there, right? Chester was there. Together, of course, with our campus ministry team. Thank you so much for all that hard work that you're doing. Or the other ministries that we have. And we have a number. See, the question you need to ask is, do you come to church to be blessed or to be a blessing? Third, serving others is inconvenient. It will mean coming out of your comfort zone. But the true people of God serve willingly, sacrificially, tirelessly, joyfully, and quietly. They don't need to make a lot of noise. They just serve. And sometimes it means part of the sacrifice is spending your hard-earned money for the sake of others. It will definitely mean sacrifice on your part. Anne, who's one of the heads of our, our campus ministry, would give up her Starbucks money just so that she can pay for the pamasahe of the students that she was ministering to to come to service. That sacrifice we all love our coffee. If you don't, you're not saved. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> See, the truth of the matter is it's easy to say yes, that you are a follower of Jesus until it becomes difficult or inconvenient. Visiting the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, showing hospitality to a stranger these require time and energy and resources on our part but this is what the true people of god do we were saved to serve and this morning i just want to first of all i want to thank all the people who serve I really do I I stand up here Sunday after Sunday and I preach and when I'm done I take a rest especially now because we have a third service we have another ministry at what time one o'clock one o'clock I'm gonna be speaking again at one o'clock and then I'll be speaking again at four o'clock and all that and and that's not the hard part. I love doing this. I really do. But there are so many people involved in the background that you don't see. And then we just help one another. You have Arnold here right now because Lawrence is not with us. And because when I get to this portion, bottom line, I need music. Otherwise, I'll never get to my bottom line and we'll be here until Jesus comes. <laughs> So he needs to play and say, Pastor, tama na yan. Huh? That's the lyrics of this, actually. He's, he's just making it instrumental, but we understand that, you know. Tama na yan, Pastor. Gutom na matao. Magpray ka na dyan. See, that's the lyrics. We, we composed that together. I did the chords, he did the lyrics for that. Together with my wife, they collaborated on that. But see, there's so many people behind the scenes, the production people, the ushers, kids' church, you don't see them, but they're taking care of your kids over there, about 100 meters away from us. You know, and, and our production assistants, everyone, the people that are manning our gathering grounds, our intercessors who pray daily so that something like this can happen. I mean, you've just got this whole production of people making things happen. You know what I'm saying? Get involved. Get involved. Amen. Get involved.
You know, I was just so blessed because a few moments ago, we didn't know who was going to do the announcements. There's a little confusion. You know, was it going to be Cassie? Was she going to do it in the 4 o'clock and, and all that? And then Chester was there and he says, I'll do it. You know, just right there on the spot. I'll do it. Then finally they found out, oh, Cassie's going to do it. Oh, I wanted to do it. <laughs> you know, it's that willingness to serve. Amen. Be willing to serve. And all those who clap, get ready. We'll call on you to do the announcements. Okay. <laughs> Grab a dangerous pala to clap here. You know? I didn't know clapping was volunteering. I thought you had to raise your hand. No, here you clap. Okay. But I want to pray for you because there is so much joy in serving. And you won't know until you try. And I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes it doesn't always feel joyful. It's at the end of the day. Even, no matter how tiring, no matter, even if someone shouts at you, says, Oi, bilisan mo dyan! You know, and sometimes patience gets a little short because things need to happen, things need to get done. Way back in the day when I was also serving, I wasn't a pastor yet, we would have this saying, you know, check your heart. We always say that. When you're getting angry, ano ba? Oops, check your heart. Ikaw na galit, ikaw pa mag-check your heart, di ba? And we would always say that. And if we say anything that is painful, like, ano ba? Ang bagal, bagal mo. And you feel like hitting that person who said that, we say, you know what? If you want to cry, you want to get hurt, you want to talk to the person, do it after. When everything is done, cry all you like. Go to the person, talk to them. In the meantime, there's work that needs to be done. Do it first. And while you're doing it, check your heart. Because if you're making the book, you might break the speakers. So check your heart while you do it. And that was good training for us. Our pastor then was, I tell you, he was, I think I need to be more like that, you know? Check your heart. But I want to pray for you. Because my joy in serving is indescribable. And I wish that all of you would be able to experience that joy as you serve God. And we have ministries. Talk to Pastor Yoli. Talk to Pastor Bless. You know, talk to Pastor Arnold if you think you have a gift in singing or playing the instruments. Talk to him. And we need volunteers. Kids Church. Talk to Teacher Mapo. Get involved. Let me pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we are your kids your sons and daughters. But we also know that we're called to serve. So Lord, give us the grace to truly humble ourselves and to count others better than ourselves so that we can serve with gladness of heart. That we might serve with the right motives because that's what you reward and it's not just about the rewards. We want to be pleasing to you because we truly love you. And so Lord, turn our hearts and cause us, cause us, work in our hearts and cause us to become humble and to serve you. And I thank you because this is your work in us. And I look forward to the day when, when we will be able to raise up many partners in ministry so that for the sake of those who will still be uh, coming to this church, for the sake of those who will still be getting saved through the many people that come here, for their sake, we might be able to serve them and let them know that they are loved. First by you, second by us. And may we not judge ourselves when we serve, but rather understand that this is the highest calling in your kingdom because this is a kingdom of servants. 
sons and daughters who serve. Give us the right mindset, O Lord, and the right heart so that we can serve with such joy and, and enthusiasm that even on the difficult days, there's still a smile on our face because we are serving you above all. Not just men, not just the ministry, but you. And help us to be faithful and obedient until our final breath. This is my prayer for each one, O oh Lord. And I thank you. I speak that blessing on all. In Jesus' name, and all of God's servants said, Amen and Amen and Amen. God is good, Amen. God is good. Quickly, some discussion questions so I can release you first. Jesus seemed to have no difficulty serving people, including caring for the vilest of sinners, the rejects of society, and even touching lepers. If He's willing to do that, are you? Why or why not? And second, sharing Jesus is the best gift you can give to anyone. Are you willing to share the gospel with your family and friends and inviting them to church? Can we expect to see them in the next week or two? See, he, we here at Words of Life would love to welcome your family and friends. So please take the time to, you know, introduce them to us when you bring someone new. And let them know. He says, you know what, Pastor? Uh, I brought someone new. Right? This is my friend. This is my family. This is whoever that person might be. And also, we've got on our Facebook page, uh, just click there on the, I don't know, how, it's, how do you do that again? The messages on the Facebook page, right? Click messages and you'll see some chat, chat bots, right? And say, uh, I'm bringing a new friend or something like that. Put their picture there, their name, so that when they come, if they come ahead of you, at least we can greet them. They don't look like, where's my friend, you know? And then they look all alone, right? And then they'll wait far away so we don't even know that this is where they want to come. We want to welcome everyone. So help us welcome them. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. One of the ways we serve God, by the way, is being faithful in our tithes and offerings. Because it's something the Bible says that we owe Him. We pay it back to Him, our tithe, 10% of our income. And that's part of being faithful. It's part of being faithful. So as you go out, there will be offering boxes there. I just want to remind you. I don't talk about this all the time, so this time I'm just letting you know, okay? Your tithes is what we bring to God, what we return to God because it's His. The Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. And then the offering, just be generous. Okay, there's no fixed amount for that. The tithe is 10%. The offering is out of the joy in your heart because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for all who are here and those watching us as well online. Thank you for their lives. And now the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with such favor and grant you peace, the covenantal blessing that covers every area of your life so there will be nothing missing and nothing broken. And unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to make you stand in his presence with great joy, the one and only true God, to him alone, be all the praise and honor, dominion and authority, both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, and all of his faithful servants said, Amen and Amen.